Welcome, warmly welcome to this BUP webinar series on education for sustainable development or sustainability in teaching and research at universities. We are now almost 100 person here on, uh, on Zoom and this occasion will also be live stream on YouTube and recorded. My name is Cecilia Lundberg and I come from the Baltic University program Finland at Obo Academy University, which is one of uh, BUP's uh, associated secretariats. Uh, we have uh, education for sustainable development and programs for teachers in higher education as our focus area. And Together with me, this, I have planned this webinar series together with Shepard Urenje at uh, Svedest, Swedish International Center for Education for Sustainable Development at Uppsala University, and Pontus Ambros and Dusan Balint from the headquarter of BUP at Uppsala University. And this is the first webinar in a series of four one per month from December until March next year. And I guess most of you are familiar with Baltic University program, but those of you, of you that are new one, I just want to mention that BUP is a network for universities in the Baltic Sea drainage area. We have uh, almost 90 member universities. And BUP are supporting strong regional education and research communities and aims to promote openness, internationalization and mobility. And uh, sustainable development has been the focused, for, focused area for BUP since the beginning, which is already almost 30 years back. So we can say we have been a forerunner in sustainable development. And now I will not take your time, but give the word over to Shepard, who will introduce our keynote for today. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Yes, welcome everyone to our first webinar. We are excited because this is the first one. We hoped we were going to meet in Visby, but it didn't happen but we will meet here more often. We, are, we will be able to have more people in this conference or in these webinars because of the COVID. We can now have more people here. We will miss each other, of course. Okay, now it is my privilege today to introduce to you our first keynote speaker for these webinars, Professor Arian Walls. I happen to have known Professor Arian Walls for a long time, since the time I was still in Southern Africa, that is before 2010. And then from 2010, we were working with him at Swedest. Uh, Arian Walls is a professor of transformative learning for socio-ecological sustainability at the Fachenigen University. I don't know whether I've said that correct, correctly, Okay, this is in the Netherlands, okay? And he is also the UNESCO Chair of Social Learning and Sustainable Development. And he is also a visiting professor at the Norwegian Life Science University. And he, his recent work focuses on transformative social learning in vital coalitions of multiple stakeholders at the interface of science and society. What you, will, uh, what you will get most from Arian is his passion for learning for social transformation. Learning that results in real change in communities and schools and the linkages between those two. The rest, I think I should leave you to find out from him when you visit his blog. I will put the link to his blog in the chat and you will be free to go there and see the different things that he is doing there. 
And I would like to thank you very much, Arian, for joining us for our first webinar here. And I will now give the floor to you. Thank you. And one thing before, before I let Arian start, we encourage you all to be active on the chat because you are too many here to, to raise your question loudly or comments. So please use the chat function throughout the Arian's presentations. And Pontus and I will keep an eye and, on it and bring it up then afterwards. So please, Arian. Thank you, <laughs> Cecilia. Thank you, Shepard. And it's an honor to be the kickoff speaker for this series. And uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to see so many faces or names in black boxes, depending on what you do with your camera. This has kind of become the new normal uh, for me. And I think for many of you watching a, a screen with lots of faces. Um, and uh, I must say, uh, in some ways, it's, it's nice. We can be in many different places uh, without traveling, uh, which is, I think, a good thing. There's a lot of, uh, even in sustainability science and sustainability education, there's a lot of people who chat locally and travel globally, which is not the right uh, way, I think. And uh, um, but at the same time, it's also very challenging to keep people interested and, and engaged, uh, I find, um, here at Wageningen University. Uh, but I'm sure it's not, un not uh, unlike in your university. Uh, we are trying to creatively uh, to get our students to leave the screen. And we say more green time and less screen time. Uh, but also by having some activities uh, online uh, during the classrooms, online classrooms of like chair yoga uh, is one of the activities that we do with some classes. But we also have open mics where students uh, who are good at music, uh, singer songwriters during breaks do a performance. And this is a way to make things a little bit more uh, engaging. Um, but I won't be singing today. Uh, I will just try to, uh, to, to highlight um, and I'll share my screen uh, as I say this. Uh, let's see if that is going to work. Uh, share. Uh, yes. There we go. So, um, yes, the theme, I think, on, on the seminar series, it's about implementing sustainability in universities. Um, I changed it a little bit. Um, I, I, I always like to think uh, that as soon as we start thinking in terms of innovation and reorienting, rethinking education and we see it as an implementation problem um, it is uh, actually uh, we're missing the point it is really about co-creating uh, transitions towards sustainability i think if there's uh, one thing that we have learned over the years is that we need to involve the different uh, stakeholders in the whole system in kind of conceptualizing imagining uh, alternative ways of teaching and learnings that can reconnect people with planet, uh, that can lead to more caring society, um, where we have um, an eye for the future, but also an eye for the well-being of, of all people. And I think um, um, Kate Raworth, the economist from the United Kingdom, has developed a quite a, a, a simple um, model, the donut uh, model, uh, to, to show what the challenge is also for higher education. And that is to find what she calls that safe and just space for humanity uh, that allows us to remain within the ecological or the planetary boundaries of the earth without upsetting ecosystems um, and, and major systems that have been formed over billions of years uh, without altering those uh, systems in, in, in a very short period of time, which we are doing as, as humanity, as we find ourselves in the Anthropocene at the moment. But at the same time, also creating this, uh, this social foundation where people have a voice, where people are, 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 are considered equal, uh, where there is peace and justice, but also health and 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 good and and uh, healthy food and nutrition, access to clean water, energy, 
good education and so on. And um, which also means, as she says, we need to rethink uh, the economy, uh, not uh, an economy that is based on growth and expansion and continuous innovation to create new markets and so on, but a, a regenerative, a, re, uh, a regenerative cyclical or circular economy uh, where it's not about maximization of, of profit, but also maximization, or maybe foremost, maximization of meaning and purpose. And this connects well with the 17 sustainable development goals. Some are more at the heart of this figure, connecting with the social foundation, like quality education, uh, reducing inequalities, uh, creating partnerships, uh, good health and well being, whereas others are more on the outskirts, connecting more with uh, the, those ecosystems life on land, life below water, uh, climate action, to name a few. So how can higher education connect people and planet and, and help people live within this safe and just foundation? One, one part of doing this is that we kind of unlearn what we have learned in, in our schools and universities. And that is to think of the world in disciplines, in, in boxes, in categories, in sectors, but to kind of transcend that reductionist way of thinking into a more relational way of thinking, where it's more about how things are connected, how things are interdependent, um, how we can uh, um, move ourselves between different perspectives, also in time skills, past, uh, present, future, um, where we uh, are becoming more able in thinking systemically and seeing the earth as a whole and our relation to the to the world rather than seeing the world into uh, boxes and to uh, to make distinctions and to draw boundaries so we see um, that we need and this is where i think higher education has to play a, a major role where we need to rethink the way we look at um, what we create the way we look at what we value the way we look at our kind of habitual behaviors that we have created and the, where we normalize unsustainability we make living unsustainable lifestyles very easy while living sustainably very difficult the picture on the right here is, is kind of the, the uh, symbolic for the world that we have created with a lot of uh, higher education knowledge a lot of engineering power a lot of innovation has created the cars has created the systems that you see the kind of urbanization that you see which is not based on an ethic of care or an ethic of solidarity or of community but generally of an education of an ethic of expansion growth innovation taking care of the individual citizen um, and and where the corporate well-being has been in a way privileged over personal well-being and so we we can no longer suffice with business as usual and we can no longer suffice with education as usual so we need to think in terms of a transition recreating a society on different values than the ones that we have been emphasizing so far um, and this transition perspective is taking a hold in different parts of, of the world. And there are all kinds of niches that we can see around localized food, localization of power, local ecosystems, uh, biodiversity in cities, sponge cities yeah, for water, extreme weather, water abs absorption, um, social innovation, peer-to-peer -peer financing. There's lots of... Um, um, movements you could say that all seek to come off the grid disconnected for from this globalization towards a more localization of uh, of development and this is a counter trend you might say and we see this uh, in different spheres of society around food governance spirituality design new forms of economics and a, a question that we need to ask as, as people working for universities is how do we connect with these initiatives how do we connect with these different stakeholders in society trying to co-create a better a more equitable uh, a, a healthier way of living that does not uh, um, compromise planetary boundaries so this i think is is a, a big question for for our our, our universities and 
one thing that we uh, must be maybe paying more attention to is what I call transition management and transition science, where when you when when people agree that we cannot recreate our society on the same kind of principles and values that have created an unsustainable world, but where we need to rethink our values, this kind of a deeper transition where we can no longer optimize the systems that we have created, then we need to think about deeper learning that that affects um, our, 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 our deeper, our inner sustainability, you might call, which has to do with values and principles but also how we can connect these different niches in society so that they become more powerful and they become a movement that can actually lead to a new normal. That in ecology terms, how we move from niches to regimes and how we move from regime, regimes to changing the whole landscape. And you can see lots of examples. If you look at, for instance, localized food systems, you can see that it often starts small by people uh, re re-changing -ch school grounds or in early childhood, rethinking the, school, the, the, the surroundings of an early childhood center or guerrilla gardening where people find a space in the city that's unused, underutilized, neglected, and people start taking control of that space by maybe start planting seeds and beautifying that. And then seeing how the community responds and it could lead to more social cohesion. The city might actually start appreciating what's happening that start supporting it. And eventually things can shift and where a new normal is created, where they start supporting community gardens, for instance, which we see rising everywhere at the moment in many parts of the world, greening of cities. And eventually um, it's no longer just about greening, about biodiversity or about local food. It's the whole nexus about climate, mobility, water, social cohesion and then we start really transitioning towards a new normal where in a way the city is breathing sustainability and is inviting more sustainable behaviors and lifestyles and where companies are also beginning to recognize that if they are to remain viable in the future they have to become a part of this movement so this is and, and in universities you could also say we have these niches and it could be people starting some a course on gender and climate change or adaptation, or it could be students, Fridays for Future, climate strikes, who start these niches and try to uh, create momentum in rethinking deeper values. And eventually that could lead to whole programs in sustainability science and solutions, for instance, or a minor around uh, food and nutrition and social justice and, and food sovereignty. and. So, and we see many universities starting to, to develop these kinds of uh, specializations, inter-specializations, often transdisciplinary. And also what we're now seeing is this idea of living labs where, where the local environment is becoming a resource for education and a driver of education where the, the concerns people in the community have, students' own concerns are becoming more central in the learning. And the university itself is also a living lab for experimenting more, with more sustainable ways of living. So this is kind of the transition that we are needing to, to uh, um, foster and strengthen in our universities. And it does mean rethinking how we teach, who sets the learning goals, how we assess learning, new kinds of indicators for that, involving more people looking at cultural and social cultural shifts that might take place as a result of this, changing policies, changing governance to allow for this boundary crossing and this learning, this social learning between different groups, trying to experiment, trying to move towards sustainability, not with a moral compass of expansion, growth, employability, not with the question of what does the economy ask from us, but really, what does the earth ask from us and how can we um, um, rethink the purpose of education and kind of um, the meaning of life really. So one area of expertise that we need to also develop more is understanding how transitions and transformations take place. What, uh, how do we get locked in in certain paths? How do we, 
um, get stuck in certain bubbles where people are like-minded and like to listen to each other, but we're not opening up towards diversity and different voices anymore. How do we use different tensions and contradictions that we find in everyday life and sometimes even hypocrisy? How can we start questioning those differences in a way or the binaries how can we bring them together how can we learn from each other how can we ex uh, use dissonance as a positive force for change how can we move to what we call transformative pathways and move away from these undesirable pathways i don't have time to go into this but um, these two figures this slide as well they come from a new report that is just out. It is 71 visions of Wageningen University about how, uh, what role um, Wageningen University can play in social environmental transformations in society. And there are 71 examples of how the university tries to do that in a collaborative way using different uh, disciplinary vantage points, including the arts and the humanities, which play a big role in this. So here you see how you can move from these lock, how you have lock-ins that keep you from changing and how you have enablers that can facilitate transitions. And students need to reflect, and not just students, staff as well, need to think about what are underlying mechanisms that keep us from changing. Uh, what is working with us in trying to change? What is working against us? So also the political institutional environments, how do they work? But also how do our individual mindsets, our values, our beliefs, our assumptions, how do they uh, help us uh, envision alternatives or how do they keep, keep us blind from seeing alternatives? These are very important existential questions that we do not engage in much in our universities. This is uh, uh, from uh, um, the Amsterdam Metropolitan uh, a solutions uh, institute ams where the the living the urban living lab has become the main vehicle for teaching learning doing research and um, it's all around uh, questions that the city of amsterdam is running into with regards to tour sustainable tourism water management greening the city air quality so metropolitan uh, challenges uh, um, that all um, have an element, an inevitable element of sustainability. And students in groups work on these issues together with what we call the diamond, the, the, the diamond five, the world, the world of work, the world of um, governance, the world of education, the world of research, and the world of civil society, the NGOs. All together, they investigate these issues. They bring in their own expertise, their own wisdom, Sometimes it's experiential knowledge, sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, local knowledge from people living in the neighborhoods, sometimes it's scientific knowledge, and sometimes it's even ancient indigenous knowledge. Even in the city of Amsterdam, we find some of that uh, still available. Um, and how to blend these multiple ways of knowing is another challenge. Uh, that higher education needs to engage in. I'm not going to uh, share all these uh, steps in this living lab model, but I think it's uh, it's emerging. Sometimes it's challenge labs, change labs. It's all characterized by boundary crossing, uh, by co-creating solutions, by having joint ownership, empowering people to experiment and to make change, and to also look for new kinds of indicators, signs of empathy, signs of social cohesion, um, signs of um, dealing with uh, differences, inviting diversity, and so on. Wageningen University also has a, another course that all master students uh, from all programs um, follow, which is the ACT, it's the Academic Consultancy Training, where small groups of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary groups address an issue posed by a societal actor that that actor could be a local food store that is losing um, customers to the big Aldi or the big uh, uh, what you have in 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 the Baltic uh, countries, the big grocery stores that are also having organic food, for instance, and local organic stores are losing customers to these big chains that also have organic. How do they maintain their customers in this shifting environment? And then students work on that question. Um, and they, they give an advice. That's why it's called consultancy. And they are 
they're working with people in the university who know something about that topic. It could be in this case, marketing or organic agriculture. They also have a process coach, somebody who knows a lot about how you work in, in, in diverse groups and how you deal with conflict in groups. But they also work, uh, and they also work with the commissioner, the person from that local store who knows a lot about the customers coming in and the ones who are not coming anymore. So there's different uh, voices and different kinds of coaching that they are uh, benefiting from. And they are all um, assessing their work from their own perspective and then they assess their own work as a group. And this together leads to a very rich learning environment um, where you have multiple actors um, um, working on finding solutions to real authentic issues posed by people in society. This report I already mentioned to you, the link uh, uh, I'll make available, you can have a look at it. I think the essence of all these types of learning is that it's, it's, it's an eco a learning ecology where we look at how what people bring to the learning, their filters, their values, their frames, how they look at the world, make it explicit, confront people with differences. Also looking at the different kinds of media, technology, language that we are using to, to, to learn together and recognizing that we can learn in so many different ways, citizen science, online communities, offline communities, mentoring, apprenticing, self-learning, games, simulation, and that we need to think more in how can we connect these different forms of learning, recognize these different forms of learning so that we step outside of the formal classroom and, and certainly at the moment in the times of COVID, we are beginning to see that there, there are multiple ways of knowing and learning that we are not always tapping into that we might be tapping into more in the future. And it has different dimensions. It's not just learning to know or to do. It's also about learning to care, learning to be and learning to transform, learning to make change. These are the Delors pillars, a little bit uh, ex expanded maybe, Jacques Delors. Um, um, who, the, who came up with these pillars already a long time ago. Ultimately, it's about creating wisdom where we, do, where we are more wise in how we use resources, how we connect to each other, how we connect to the non-human world as well, and how we connect uh, uh, um, with the future generations as well. So this um, um, is, is, is a more ecological understanding of, of teaching, learning and capacity building that maybe not all students or all programs need to be emphasizing, but certainly some students and some programs uh, should be mindful of this more integrated holistic way of teaching and learning. If you're interested in this perspective, this is a book by Ron Barnett and Norman Jackson. It just came out last year where, where these kinds of ecological ways of learning are described. Okay, um, I'm slowly going to the end, but what we are looking for, I think, as a, as a kind of a concrete utopia, you might call it, is this kind of whole institution or a whole school or a whole university approach to sustainability, where it is about using the local university itself as a place to experiment with, with sustainable food, with, with uh, alternative energy, uh, with mobility, with uh, greening the campus. So it becomes a living curriculum in a way and students participate in deciding and making decisions about how can we make the campus more equitable, uh, more gender sensitive, more culturally sensitive and so on. Um, and that was somebody calling me, sorry about that. Um, but also that we look at how, how is participation and democracy organized in, in the system? Um, how do we address with emerging topics? How resilient are we as a community in light of global challenges? And this kind of whole integrated approach is, is um, becoming more and more uh, um, um, prominent also in United Nations UNESCO strategy uh, for ESD and global citizenship education in the coming years. And the SDGs there are all over uh, this kind of integrated approach, they're everywhere. And I think it's also important that we do not see the SDGs as separate SDGs, because then it becomes a new form of reductionism where we check off different SDGs and locate them where they are in our university. 
Uh, but it's really about how, seeing how every issue that we are addressing is connected to all the SDGs. There's always a link with climate. There's always a link with water. There's always a link with gender or poverty. If we are willing and able to see the link. And if we don't see it, then that's our educational challenge to see that link. So this whole system approach, it really starts with uh, basic questions. Um, what's important to us? What is asked from us by society, by the earth? What kinds of qualities and values do we need? What kind of professional development do our teachers and our staff, all our staff, also the people working in the canteen, the people working and cleaning the buildings, they are also staff. What kinds of qualities do they need to be able to contribute to this? How do we connect with the, as a university to the community outside, to the neighborhood that we are in, to local businesses and companies, to local NGOs and activist groups? What is our connection? How can we work with them more? But also how is our own university, how can we reduce the ecological footprint of the university itself? And how can we engage students in doing that and reducing that, coming up with ideas for that and then monitoring and evaluating, is it effective? What can we do better? And of course, also looking at the pedagogy and the didactic, not just transmissive forms of learning, but also and foremost, transformative forms of learning, experiential learning, embodied learning, arts-based forms of learning. So that we expand the whole, whole basket of possibilities and, and open it up more to not just the cognitive knowing, but also the social emotional ways of knowing. And of course it does require a vision. It does require management, leadership, and forms of monitoring and evaluation. It also does mean that we look for different kinds of indicators than what we're used to in our academic and in our academic world, where we look for impact factors in journals, uh, where we might look for uh, um, efficiency in getting students in and through and out, uh, where there's efficiency driven and control and management driven kind of accountability culture is kind of stepping in, standing in the way of, of these kinds of transitions. So signs of empathy, attentiveness, intuitive action, signs of conviction. These are different kinds of indicators, signs of creativity that we need to be looking for. And there's lots of resources, of course, that we can use in doing this, lots of tools and mechanisms that are available that we can integrate in these kinds of uh, learning processes. This is from the Wageningen University Center for Development Innovation. And they have a guide, the MSP guide, and mspguide.org is a wonderful portal for tools and, and support mechanisms for social learning towards sustainability. And here's another toolkit that I think some of you might find very interesting. The slides will be shared. It's also recorded. So if you want to just Google this and you get the PDF, it's all freely available. And here are just some examples from students. Just the last class I taught a few months ago, where we also invite students to reflect more on, on their own connection. In this case, their, their own connection with the living environment. And, and also trying to, to, to give them the space and the freedom to use arts and different ways of expressing their, their, their thoughts and their feelings. This is from one of them, um, where she in the week two, it was about connecting with nature and the local environment. And, and in the week four, it was more about uh, sustainability and how we connect to today's global challenges. And, and this is also the same student. Um, collecting uh, plastic she used in one week and, and kind of drowning in, in, in that plastic and reflecting on that and how she feels and making these feelings kind of uh, um, more explicit and talking about them in the class really generates a very rich learning environment that, that to students is extremely meaningful, especially now. So to some key points, we need to break the logic of efficiency, growth and innovation and accountability, it's killing the spaces for transition and the freedom to learn. A more radical response is needed than adding on sustainability or climate change or citizenship to the curriculum. Um, we need to really a whole, a whole system redesigned to have these more relational ways of learning 
and these more action-oriented ways of learning that allow for boundary crossing, uh, critical thinking, but also for the wisdom that we need to become more sustainable. There are lots of niches in the university usually, lots of whether it's sit spots, food forests or Extinction Rebellion or Friday for Fut Futures, uh, uh, movements that are there. How can we tap into that more as a university? How can we have more freedom for students to connect with this in our education? We need to also think that they're mindful of a culture of fear that often students feel anxiety about the future. How do we create a pedagogy of hope that also invites concrete action and shows that we do, we can change things and that things have already changed to avoid uh, anxiety, depression and, and powerlessness. And that's all something that we need to be really uh, mindful of. And we need to make sure that people do not see sustainable development as doom and gloom or negative. It can be positive, it can be fun, it can be playful, it can be lighthearted, but we don't often emphasize that. And I think we need to get better at that. Uh, here's some questions we might talk about uh, in the coming 20 minutes or so. Um, so it's also a question about design. How can we, how can systemic and transitional forms of education for sustainability be best designed, organized, supported, facilitated, evaluated? How can the university become and the actors in them become more relational, connected to place, people, other species and, and things matter uh, that we create? How can we have a deeper connection with these things and um, and the non-human world, as well as our fellow species, also far away in time and space? What kind of pedagogy does that require? How can ICT and not big data, but small data, support learners in investigating sustainability issues? The role of citizen science or civic science in that? And lastly, how can university connect with transition niches, niches and vice versa? How can these transition niches benefit more from all the knowledge and wisdom that we can find in our universities? That we should also ask. That's it. I'm sorry I talked too long. I always lose sense of time when I talk on Zoom. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Um, uh, Shepard already shared, I think, uh, the, the link to the blog if you want more information. Uh, it's also here at the bottom. Um, you can also send me an email if you feel after this talk, like, oh, I really need to get in touch or I have something that, that I might be interested in uh, or you'd like to have additional information or some literature, feel free uh, to, to contact me and I'd be happy uh, to engage and to respond. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'll stop sharing now and we can see if there is any thoughts from the audience or some questions that you might have. Thank you, Arjen, very interesting. And I'm full of new information, so just to have to ingest all this. But we already have two comments or questions here from, from the audience, which is almost over, or it's over 100 persons here. Uh, here's one question. Does the universities have a role as leaders in the transition by practicing what they teach? For example, by lowering their CO2 emissions according to the Paris Agreement. Yes. So now there are different, uh, I, of, you know, I think uh, there is a moral uh, responsibility for universities to, uh, to learn to live and to uh, as an institution within planetary boundaries and, and reducing uh, CO2 uh, emissions is part of that. But rather than, um, than, than my suggestion would be, then rather than um, outsourcing the, the research for figuring out how best to do that would be to make that into an educational project a continuous learning process where there's always students and staff. We have so much brain power in our universities. Why would we then have the board of the university hire a company to figure out 
uh, where how whether we should to uh, how many solar panels are needed on buildings or something like that. Let students investigate that. Let I let them identify. Uh, what best uh, what the best energy transition pathway is for the university given what we know today um, let them figure out if it is solar what buildings what angles should they be positioned in relation to the sun what kind of panels should they be panels from germany or should they be from china uh, what what kind of how do we look at the whole chain of these panels what do we do with the panels when they don't work anymore might there be a circular way of using these panels can they have a second life or should we look at more at travel of staff and international travel and flights and let them figure out a system uh, so make it a learning process rather than something uh, a job that we can uh, can kind of uh, hire a company to do it is a continuous learning process and also recognizing that what we thought might be sustainable today in the canteen in terms of food and nutrition uh, um, might not turn out to be so sustainable tomorrow. So it, it is always a, a continuous search. It's a recalibrating. It's a, it, it needs to be driven by curiosity, passion, and a concern about the future and the well-being of people and planet. So the, it has to do with the moral compass as well as with empowering students and staff to make those changes in their own local environment themselves and learning from it. Thank you. And here are more, more questions and comments popping up. Here is one saying, some subjects in a university embrace principle of sustainable development in their teaching and research, but they do not call those sustainable development. They just use some other terminology. Uh, should be this terminology, should this uh, terminology relate to sustainability be standardized across the acad academia? And if yes, can this be achieved or promoted? No, you know, it's, you know, I've gone back and forth on this, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, to me, it doesn't matter if we talk, if, if your entry point is, is water and sanitation, um, or if your entry point is biodiversity, or if your entry po point is health. Uh, the key point is, I think, that when we talk about health, sanitation, water, that we also have an eye for gender, that we also have an eye for um, that that um, that there is an economic aspect, there is an ethical aspect, there's an environmental aspect. The key is the relational way of thinking. The key is the underlying ethic of being concerned about the quality of life, not just for yourself or your own community, but also for others, distant futures, distant people, that there is a kind of a, a sense of, 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 of wanting to uh, to have a good life, but not just for yourself, also for others and also for future generation. So whether we call it sustainability or sustainable development, sometimes it can be strategic to use the SDGs, for instance, to get people in management interested in what you want to do. But the flag under which you operate is not as important as what you actually do and the values that are underneath. Yes, and here is one. Uh, could you, Arjen, say more about the role of indigenous First Nations people and traditional knowledge and wisdom in transforming what universities do? Well, I think there's, a, you know, there's this what I call epistemological justice and ontological pluralism. So epistemological justice has to do with recognizing that there are multiple ways of knowing and that scientific knowledge is not necessarily superior or better than other ways of knowing. The ontological pluralism is to recognize that we have in the West, you know, call it the West or the global North, we have developed a kind of a, an ontology that centers the human and that sees the human as the one who's smart and intelligent and um, is exceptional, who is able to kind of control and manage everything around us. Um, and this is kind of a cybernetic worldview. 
that is, uh, has brought us in some ways the kind of technology that we use today to be able to communicate, you know, the Zoom, the computers, the, you know, so it's brought us lots of advanced uh, uh, um, good things, you might say, but it is compromising uh, many uh, processes and mech uh, mechanisms that are are, that are actually in the end destroying and self-destructive. And this is why the, where the indigenous ways of knowing come in, they have it. And there's also pluralism within them. So it's not, I don't want to kind of cluster them and lump them all together, but many indigenous peoples have what I would call a relational ontology where they see them, where they decenter the human, where they're able to see the exceptional qualities of other living beings, where they can, where they feel connected even with matter, whether this is stones, rocks, or things that are all around us. And, and it's not, and I think we can learn a lot from that. Um, and I think we can even in, in the things that we make, if we have our heart and soul in the things that we make, and if we have a very mindful way of buying things, paying a lot of attention to what we buy, establishing a relationship with what we buy, have more connection with it, then we're less likely to discard of it easily or quickly. Um, we will hold on to it longer. We want to extend its lifetime. We want to share it because we don't want to see it go to waste. So we can learn a lot from indigenous ways of, of being in the world because they are more mindful of the things around us and they're more deeply connected to the world around us. And that deep connection is so central, I think, to sustainability. So this is why um, indigenousness, not as something exquisite or eccentric to study from a far distance, but to really uh, learn, comprehend, and try to live it is, is really, I think, uh, uh, a challenge, but something that we must be open to. And then we have here a question about inspiring teacher. Uh, in You just briefly penetrated how to make people inspired. Could you please say some words how to inspire teacher colleagues at the university? To I think... Yeah, yes. it's, I think it's inspiring. You inspire by by example. I think you inspire by having students be enthusiastic uh, and and getting that spark of of wanting to go a little deeper or a little further, uh, or being a bit more disruptive. The most inspiring teachers are also the ones who are dare are daring to do things a little differently. They're a bit disruptive or transgressive. They recognize. Uh, that that we must be uh, more more open towards uh, students' emotions and feelings, and that you need to be vulnerable yourself sometimes to show to show that you don't you're not an all-knowing professor. You have your own insecurities. You have your own passions. Be honest and open about these. Share them and bring them in. Um, I think that that leads to an inspiring teacher, um, and 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 students. Um, and living by example can be expiring too. If there, there's a huge contradiction, and I, that's one that I find myself in. You know, I talk a lot. Uh, I, I've traveled too many times. I've traveled to places to give talks with a huge ecological footprint, hoping that my ecological handprint of giving that talk would be bigger than my fo footprint. But often it wasn't. And 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 that is students see that they see that uh, there's an inconsistency there so you need to really be if you are going to travel you need to be able to justify that by saying well i'm going to meet these groups i'm going to talk to these groups as well i'm going to do a workshop there as well i'm not just going to go fly in talk and fly back um, but i think in the future we'll be doing a lot more of what we're doing today here which i think is very good so also being uh, consistent in in what you think in what you do that is very, uh, or can be very inspiring. Uh, show, living by example, teaching by example, and trying to um, also inspiring is, I think, when you participate in, in students' learning, not just as the teacher, but also as a co-learner. And here was another comment, perhaps about uh, inspiring, but perhaps the, the other way, how to cooperate with the university authorities uh, who could not be interested in included SG in the curriculum and in the practice? 
Well, I think a lot of university uh, uh, managers are also beginning to see that this this uh, um, commodified way of, of uh, higher education where where the students are input throughput output and and where we where, where we try to have impact uh, through the journals um, uh, where we kind of lose touch with society because you know it we must as a public university we need to be relevant for the public and we need to be relevant for the future if we are going off in in the in the direction of of the say the, the traditional disciplinary, more disciplinary, even interdisciplinary research, where we only publish in journals that are read if we're lucky by our peers, because a lot of people don't have time to read anymore. So everybody's writing and nobody's reading. Uh, so everybody's writing for nobody. That is not sustainable. And our university uh, management is beginning to see that. So we will be looking more at what is our role? What is our contribution to society? What is our contribution to sustainability? And a lot of men, and you see students are already choosing more and more uh, programs that have to do with climate, with sustainability, with health and well-being, and not so much with the, the, the kind of the career oriented programs. At least that's the case in the Netherlands. They're looking much more for meaningful types of activities uh, and purposeful types of activities than, than kind of the career oriented, making money types of careers. And the, so we have a student body that's already seeing this. And I think the university management is also beginning to see this. And the ones who do this the most are the ones who are attracting the most students, I find. Now we'll ask if Shepard had any comment or question. Okay, thank you very much, Arian. It is always uh, quite inspiring to listen to you. I, I have just realized I last listened to you quite a few years back because you've got a lot of new things that I have learned today. My, I, I would like to find out from your institution. You know, we have been working with the Baltic University Program for three years now, Cecilia, three years now. And we work on change projects in their, in their universities, trying to change their practice so that their teaching and learning is, is um, more li aligned to sustainability. But one area that they always get entangled with is that when you integrate sustainability issues or when you bring in sustainability competencies like creativity, innovation, and especially the emotions and the values into your teaching and learning, these ones are not very easy to, to assess. And universities are about assessment. Because when you, how do you assess, how do you integrate assessment into your teaching and learning? Because the university itself is, found, is founded on a very traditional, strong foundation and you would like to move from there. And within your classroom, we are trying really hard to change that. How do you integrate assessment for sustainability with the traditional way of teaching? How has your institution dealt with this? Well, I think, uh, um, I, I think it's not so much a matter of integrating in traditional teaching. I think there is a place for traditional teaching Mm. And some things are better taught in what we call traditional teaching. Mm. But if we are talking about um, 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 teaching around what we call these wicked sustainability challenges for which there are no universal answers and for, uh, for which, um, which require uh, um, kind of engagement with the, the, the head, heart and hands, so to say, uh, the, the social, emotional, the cognitive, uh, the transformational, um, then so the whole human being in, in, a, in kind of a, in the whole um, 
in a kind of oh, this this is my image the whole whole you know human being in a whole uh institution approach to sustainability yeah where where everything is kind of reinforcing each other but i'm not saying that we need to integrate in regular teaching sustainability it's much more about opening up spaces for students to explore existential issues that matter to them or to their community or to the future that they often self-identify um, and that in where they see first where they reflect on what are my own values in relation to this issue but then also what are other values in relation to this issue what are different interests around this issue so kind of understanding mapping the different positions that are there uh, but also um, um, opening the, the values question is I think very important for one we must recognize that universities are continuously uh, advocating certain values at the moment. They are the values of excellence. They are the values of taking care of yourself. They're the value of competing with your peers. They're the value of being flexible on the labor market and being resilient, you know, and a lot of resilience is unhealthy, I think, because there are so many systems that are unhealthy that are very resilient. So we are cultivating, whether we like it or not, particular values that are not very sustainable. So becoming aware of that is already a first step. In terms of assessment, as I was showing in my presentation, uh, one example is to, to also look at uh, giving students more freedom to express their learning. Also uh, using arts uh, is very important there. Um, having students assess each other's work in the ACT example of the students working in interdisciplinary group, they are assessed by the, by the coach who guides their, their group work. They, that coach looks at the quality of how they work together as a group. The commissioning uh, person from say the local food store is assessing the quality of the advice they give to that store about how to maintain their customer base. So that's another assessment. Then there's the, the scientific uh, advisor from the university, from the marketing or the organic agriculture in the example I gave, who looks at the quality of their scientific work and gives assessment based on that. Then the group also gives us a, a mark for their own work, what they, you know, how they felt they contributed to the issue, how they work together. So they get four marks from different perspectives and we average that and that's their great for that course. Of course, we must also recognize that, you know, uh, and not everything that we measure really counts and not everything that, 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 uh, uh, that, that really counts can be measured. Huh? This is a classic uh, Maslow statement. So we must be mindful. Uh, that's why I was talking about looking for signs rather than indicators, signs of empathy, signs of, uh, uh, of, of listening, attentiveness, signs of motivation. These are also a very important uh, things we need to assess or to at least uh, monitor and, and uh, uh, we're not doing that much. So we need to open up uh, uh, forms uh, of alter alternative forms of assessment for sure. And there's more and more examples of that. Thank you. And I think this was a perfect finish for today's webinar and I thank you Arjen for giving this very thoughtful speech. I think everybody has a lot of to think about now afterwards and I also uh, and as one said wrote here in in the chat your answer gives us hope for the future and I think that's true and I also thank you all the audience that has spent your afternoon here together with us, with us. And I just said, please join us again uh, in January 12, when we continue with this webinar, with the next keynote, which will be held by uh, Shepard. I don't know the, the, the title yet, but if I know Shepard right, I think it's something with thinking new and about the ability to change. So once more, thank you all and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas indeed. <laughs>